Welcome back. In the last set of web lectures, we were looking at cellular metabolism, the process by which high energy electrons, high energy bonds contained within food items that we eat are processed into usable energy in the form of ATP by transferring those high energy electrons ultimately to a molecule of oxygen. So now we want to take a step back and find out where those glucose molecules came from in the first place. Where did that oxygen come from in the first place? And both of those materials come from the process of photosynthesis. So in this first part, we're going to look at the photo part of photosynthesis. Basically, how energy is harnessed from sunlight and converted into ultimately high energy electrons by the end of the photo part of this, the light reactions that are then going to provide the energy to fuel the second part of the process, the synthesis part, where the actual um, carbon-based molecules are assembled, where carbon dioxide is fixed and reduced into a sugar molecule. So first, let's just get oriented to the idea of photosynthesis. So basically, photosynthesis is the process that feeds everything. Okay, this is basically the source of all of the food energy that we have in the biosphere. So plants and other photosynthetic organisms contain organelles called chloroplasts. And photosynthesis is the process that converts solar energy, light energy from the sun, into the chemical energy in those hydrogen-carbon or carbon-carbon bonds, and this happens within those organelles called the chloroplasts. So directly or indirectly, photosynthesis is going to nourish the entire living world. So photosynthesis occurs in plants, obviously. It also occurs in green algae, uh, certain other unicellular eukaryotes, and some prokaryotes. So let's take a look at where all of this food comes from. So autotrophs are self-feeders. These are organisms that are able to fix the carbon and carbon dioxide into sugar molecules to provide their own food. They also do the metabolism that's needed to then go through the catabolic pathways to break down those sugars to provide ATP. So they can do this without actually consuming any other organism or anything derived from any other organism. So autotrophs are, are basically the makers. They're the producers of the biosphere, producing organic molecules from CO2 and other inorganic molecules in their environment. Almost all plants are what we call photoautotrophs. So basically they use the energy of the sunlight to make organic molecules. I've mentioned in previous web lecture chemoautotrophs that gain their energy by using redox reactions involving inorganic molecules in their environment. But when we're talking about photosynthesis, when we're talking about plants and other photosynthetic organisms, we are looking at photoautotrophs. They make their food using energy that comes from the sunlight. In contrast, the, the takers, uh, as opposed to the makers, are heterotrophs. They're going to obtain all their organic material and energy from consuming other living organisms. So this can be seen at many different levels. So these are the consumers, the consumers of the biosphere. They're going to eat what the autotrophs make. So, uh, so some of these eat other living organisms, such as the living plant tissue being consumed here by the caterpillar, or other animals, such as the caterpillar here being consumed by a lizard. Some others, known as decomposers, are going to consume either dead organic material or sometimes even uh, feces, as in the case of this dung beetle um, that's rolling up a big ball of fecal material to lay its eggs in to feed its young. Uh, almost all heterotrophs, including humans, depend on these photoautotrophs for food and oxygen. Okay, so all of these carbohydrates, all of this glucose and oxygen that we use in our metabolic processes come from the photosynthetic activity of these photoautotrophs. So what is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is basically converting light energy into chemical energy. So the light energy from the sun into the chemical energy of carbohydrates or some other energy source. 
This is done in chloroplasts, and these chloroplasts are structurally similar to and likely evolved from photosynthetic bacteria. So remember that photosynthetic bacteria have these elaborate foldings of the cell membrane that create a lot of membrane surface area to collect photons of light, to collect light, and perform these chemical reactions to convert them into chemical energy. And this is very similar to this elaborate folding of the uh, thylakoids within the chloroplast, this large surface area of membrane that's going to collect up that light. So the structural organization of these organelles is going to facilitate the chemical reactions of photosynthesis. Remember this relationship between structure and function, between form and function. So we're going to see how these things are arranged and how they are arranged in such a way that it makes all of these reactions go. Leaves are the major location of photosynthesis in plants, although any green part of a plant is able to undergo uh, photosynthesis, including green fruits, stems, anything that's green has, um, has the pigments that are going to make photosynthesis go, but leaves are specialized with a large surface area to gather up the maximum amount of light. So these are the major photosynthetic organs in plants. So chloroplasts are found in cells within the leaves called mesophyll. So mesophyll is the tissue that is in the middle of the leaf. So if this is a little cutaway from this leaf, it's these cells um, in the middle. So we've got two different kinds, spongy mesophyll, palisade mesophyll. Don't worry about the difference between those. Um, and so this is the interior tissue of the leaf protected by a cuticle, some epidermal cells. So each mesophyll cell is going to contain between 30 and 40 chloroplasts. So this is a lot of chloroplasts if you're talking about the whole leaf. And so there's got to be some way of exchanging materials with the environment and the uh, carbon dioxide is going to enter and the oxygen exit through tiny little microscopic pores called stomata, singular stoma. Stoma literally means mouth, so there are these little mouths. Um, they can actually open and shut to either let carbon dioxide and oxygen pass or to prevent them from passing. This is also the way that water gets out of the leaves in the process of transpiration when the water evaporates out, drawing that water up through the system of vessels within the plant. So these stomata are basically the communication between the leaf tissue and the environment. So now looking down at the level of the chloroplast, here we see a plant cell with its cell wall and the little chloroplasts inside these mesophyll cells. If we look at the chloroplast itself, it's got a double envelope, two membranes surrounding a dense fluid. That dense fluid is called the stroma. So think of this as what's illustrated here as the empty space surrounding these stacks. And the thylakoids are these connected sacs within the chloroplast that compose a third membrane system. So these are all membrane bound uh, little compartments uh, surrounded by a membrane. And these thylakoids may be stacked in columns called grana. So one of these stacks is called a granum. A group of these stacks are called grana. So chlorophyll is the pigment that gives leaves their green color. And this pigment is going to reside in the membranes surrounding these thylakoid organelles. They're actually within that phospholipid bilayer inserted into the bilayer. So as we know, the whole point of all of this is to harness sunlight to make carbohydrates. So photosynthesis is gonna be the process of converting electromagnetic energy to chemical energy, and this is going to require sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. And the end products are gonna be oxygen as a byproduct and also sugars, carbohydrates. So the overall reaction is 6CO2 plus 12H2O plus energy from the sun is gonna give us a molecule of glucose, six oxygen, and six water molecules. So this, this should look familiar only backwards, so this is essentially the opposite of the summary 
chemical reaction that we saw in respiration. But remember that that summary, that summary reaction for cellular respiration kind of masked a whole very long and complex pathway of different reactions. And, and the same thing is true here for photosynthesis. We're not basically just going to do cellular respiration in reverse. It's going to be a whole complicated pathway. Although as you see, some of the mechanisms used in photosynthesis are going to be similar to the mechanisms used in cellular respiration. So one thing you might notice that seemed a little funny about this equation is that water is both a reactant and a product. So why not just have six water molecules go in and forget about the water molecules coming out? What is this about? So one of the steps in this process is that chloroplasts are going to split water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. And they're going to incorporate the electrons of hydrogen into sugar molecules. And they're going to release oxygen basically as a waste product. So these waters that go in are going to be split and redistributed. Some of them are going to be transferred to these sugars. Some of them are going to be reassembled back into water but not using those original water molecules. So the hydrogens are going to come from water but the oxygens are going to come from the carbon dioxide. So this is why these are kind of different water molecules coming out than what went in because of the splitting of water to form hydrogen ions which have given up their electrons to this whole process of electron transfer that we'll see in a moment and then oxygen as a waste product. So now thinking of this reaction as the reverse of cellular respiration, what I want you to do is pause this video for a moment and see if you can fill in the blanks. So we're just reversing these redox reactions that we saw in cellular respiration. So go ahead and press pause now, right on your note sheet to try to fill in these blanks up here. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at what your answers might look like. Basically, photosynthesis is going to reverse the direction of electron flow compared to respiration. So in respiration, we had the carbons and hydrogens and the carbohydrate oxidized. Remember, carbon now has less of a share of these electrons. Hydrogen has less of a share of these electrons. So the carbohydrate is oxidized to carbon dioxide. That means in this reverse reaction, carbon dioxide is going to be reduced to carbohydrate. These carbons are going to go from having a lesser share of the electrons to having equal shares with the uh, hydrogen carbon bonds and carbon carbon bonds. So the electrons are going to be pulled more toward carbon in this case, and carbon is going to be reduced. Conversely, in the case of oxygen, oxygen is going to go from having a very large share of these electrons in the form of water out to molecular oxygen, which remember is nonpolar, so those electrons are going to be equally shared. We can say that electrons are pulled away from oxygen, and oxygen is going to be oxidized. Water is oxidized to oxygen. Carbon dioxide is reduced to a sugar, just as Cellular respiration was an exergonic process. If you're going to reverse that, you're going to get an endergonic process that requires energy in order for this process to run. And in the case of photosynthesis, that energy is going to come from the electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun. So photosynthesis consists of two linked sets of reactions. We're going to talk about the first one in this web lecture. We're going to talk about the second one in the next web lecture. So the first one is called the light dependent reactions. This is the photo part of photosynthesis. And the net result of this is that oxygen is going to be formed from water. The water is going to split to form oxygen gas. Its electrons are going to be put into a highly energetic state. They're going to be excited by light energy. Uh, energy is going to be added to them. And these high energy electrons are going to be transferred to the electron carrier NADP+, forming NADPH. So this is a molecule that's closely related to NAD plus and NADH, only with a phosphate group added to it. 
and during these light dependent reactions ATP is also going to be produced by photophosphorylation and we'll see as we go how that differs from oxidative phosphorylation. And this whole process, this set of reactions is going to occur in those membranes surrounding the thylakoids. So these are going to occur in the thylakoid membrane. The second part of this process is the synthesis part. This is where the sugar actually is made. So the Calvin cycle reactions are going to ultimately produce sugar from CO2. It's going to reduce the carbon and carbon dioxide down to the carbons, the relatively nonpolar carbons in sugar molecules. So the electrons stored in NADPH that are coming from the light reactions and the ATP coming from the light reactions are going to be used to reduce CO2. So note that although ATP is produced here, it's ultimately used up in the Calvin cycle. This is not where plants get their ATP from. Ultimately, remember plants are also eukaryotes. They also have mitochondria. They're simultaneously going through these catabolic processes to break down these sugars that they have created to form the ATP that they're going to use to do their cellular work. So the ATP that's produced in the light reactions basically going to be used up in the Calvin cycle. And so this part of the process is going to occur in the stroma. Remember that fluid outside the thylakoids within that double membrane of the chloroplast. These light reactions are going to convert solar energy to the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH. So this is where we get that conversion of light to chemical energy in the form of high energy electrons. So think of chloroplasts as solar powered chemical factories. They're basically going to take the energy from the sun, transform that light energy into the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH. So before we can really dig into this series of light dependent reactions, we need to think a little bit about what light is, what it's composed of, and where this energy comes from. So first, electromagnetic radiation, the kind of radiation that comes from the sun, is a form of energy. And light is one type of electromagnetic radiation. So light has the peculiar characteristic of behaving both as a wave. So you can compare this to either a sound wave or waves in water. But it also has characteristics and behaviors that are more similar to particles. So you know, um, if you think about a wave in the water, that's not a thing, right? That's just the result of the movement of those individual water molecules all acting together. But, but light is different in that it does have characteristics of a particle as well as characteristics of a wave. In its behavior as a wave, light can be characterized by a wavelength. So this is the distance between two wave crests, if we're thinking about like a water wave. It's a distance between two areas of high pressure, if we're thinking about sound waves. But light also has these characteristic wavelengths. But in its behavior as a particle, it has discrete packets of energy called photons. And each of these photons is going to have a distinct amount of energy contained in it. So the electromagnetic spectrum displays the entire range of different wavelengths of this electromagnetic radiation. And visible light is just the portion of that spectrum that humans can see. So this is the part of this electromagnetic radiation that we would call light. So each photon and wavelength has a specific amount of energy associated with it. The energy of a photon of light is inversely proportional to its wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, the smaller amount of energy contained in that photon. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy is contained in that photon. So if we want to look at this in a graphical form, we can see this is the whole spectrum of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation going from very long radio waves all the way down to very, very short wavelength gamma rays with x-rays in there. And then just this little sliver in the middle is the visible light that we can see, what we would call light. And we've got shorter wavelengths in the uh, blue and purple region, longer wavelengths in the red region, and the red photons are going to have lower energy 
purple blue photons are going to have higher energy, shorter wavelength, lower energy, longer wavelength. So again, this photosynthesis is going to occur in these little units called chloroplasts. And photons can be absorbed, transmitted, or reflected when they strike an object. So when they come in here, they're going to either be absorbed and disappear. They can move straight through and be transmitted. So this is that idea of transparency or translucency when it comes through or it can bounce off and be reflected. So thylakoid membranes contain large quantities of pigments. And what is a pigment? A pigment is a molecule that absorbs only certain wavelengths of light, and they're going to reflect or transmit all of the other wavelengths of light. So we can think of them as absorbing particular colors. So what you're gonna see is either the reflected or the transmitted wavelengths the ones that are absorbed are going to disappear. We'll see in a moment what happens to them. So the most common pigment in the thylakoids is chlorophyll, which is going to reflect green light. If it reflects green light, that means that it's what's not absorbed, that's what's transmitted or reflected. And so this is what's gonna be responsible for the green color of plants and algae. So remember that the color that something appears is the color that is not being absorbed. If it was absorbed, you would never see it because it's gone. So there are two research methodologies I want you to be aware of. Uh, you can read about them in your book. I'm not going to go into great detail here. Chromatography is a process that allows researchers to sort of grind up plant material, dissolve the pigments in a special solvent, and be able to separate those pigments from each other to study the composition of different pigments in plants. And then once you have those pigments isolated and again dissolved in some kind of solvent, the process called spectrophotometry is going to be what will allow you to measure what wavelengths are absorbed by each pigment. So this is um, detailed in your book. It's basically passing different wavelengths of light one at a time through a sample of this pigment dissolved in a solution and measuring how much light comes out the other side. Whatever light did not come out the other side was absorbed by those pigments. So pigments are going to be very specific in the wavelengths of light that they're going to absorb. So what you're seeing here is both um, the results of one of those spectrophotometry experiments that show the absorption of light at different wavelengths for different pigments. So these green ones are chlorophylls, the orange ones are called carotenoids, we'll learn more about those in a moment. And so the lines represent those absorption spectra, that's called an absorption spectra, where at what wavelengths each of these materials is going to absorb the most light. But what we also have here with this grayed out area, this gray line, is what's called an action spectrum. We get the action spectrum by taking intact chloroplasts in a solution, exposing them to light, and taking some kind of measure of the rate of photosynthesis, either the rate of decrease of carbon dioxide in the, in the container or the rate, rate of increase of oxygen. Either of those is an indicator of the rate of photosynthesis. So this action spectrum is for the particular plant that has this composition of different kinds of pigments. And what you'll notice here is that the action spectrum measuring the rate of photosynthesis mostly tracks this one particular form of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, but it also is influenced by all of these other pigments. So there are two major classes of pigment in plants. The first is the chlorophylls. So here we see chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They're going to be absorbing different wavelengths of light, slightly different, but both of them are going to be absorbing in the range of red and blue. So both of these are going to appear green because that is what's going to be transmitted. And then the carotenoids are going to mostly absorb blue and green light. And so these are going to reflect yellow, orange, and red light. And so they're going to appear in those colors. This is the structure of one of these chlorophyll molecules. So chlorophyll consists of a forfarin ring. We can think of this as sort of the head region that's going to actually absorb the photons of light 
and they are mostly made of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, what you would expect in an organic molecule, but they also have this magnesium atom at the center, this metallic element at the center that's going to influence its behavior. And then it also has a hydrocarbon tail. So this hydrocarbon tail is going to interact with the hydrophobic regions of proteins inside the thylakoid membrane. So the action spectrum for photosynthesis is broader than the absorption spectrum of any one of these pigments and broader than the absorption spectrum for chlorophyll. So if any one of these chlorophylls was doing all of the photosynthetic activity, you would expect that action spectrum to precisely correlate with it, but it doesn't. So these accessory pigments, the other chlorophyll, and the carotenoids are going to broaden the spectrum. It's going to increase the different wavelengths of light that can be used for photosynthesis. And the slight difference in absorption spectrum between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B is due to just a very small difference in the structure between these molecules. It's basically one functional group that has a methyl group in chlorophyll A and a carbonyl group in chlorophyll B. So what's the role of these carotenoids and other accessory pigments? They're responsible for the gorgeous fall colors we're about to experience here in New England. Um, but aside from that, the carotenoids and xanthophylls and other pigments are accessory pigments. They're found within the chloroplasts and they're going to absorb light and they can pass energy onto the chlorophyll pigments. We'll see how that works in just a moment. And also since they absorb wavelengths of light, that are not absorbed by chlorophyll. They're going to appear in different colors, but they can also broaden the amount of light, the different forms of light that can be used in photosynthesis. So they're going to extend the range of wavelengths that can drive these photosynthetic reactions. It's also thought that they can protect these chlorophylls from the negative effects of excessive light. So one thing they can do is actually just absorb and dissipate excess light, but it's also thought that they can stabilize free radicals and prevent them from doing cellular damage within the plant cells. So when light is absorbed, electrons enter an excited state. What does this mean? What does it mean for light to be absorbed? What is an excited state of an electron? This is all very vague at this point. So when a photon strikes chlorophyll, its energy excites an electron or bumps it into a higher energy state. What actually happens? So if we think way, way back to this idea of these electron shells, remember the lowest potential energy is when the electrons are nice and close to the nucleus, um, close to the protons that are gonna be really attractive to it. And then as we move out to these outer electron shells, the potential energy is going to be higher because they're going to be farther from the nucleus. They're going to be less stable the farther they are from the nucleus. So when we say an electron has been excited, that means some energy has been added to it that's going to cause it to jump to a different electron shell. So it can jump from one shell to the next. It can even bypass shells if it gets a lot of energy and jump two shells. But what's going to happen in terms of jumping from one shell to another is going to depend on how much energy is contained in the photon that's hit it. So the specificity of these pigments for particular wavelengths of light is based on the potential energy difference between these electron shells. Only a photon that has exactly the amount of energy that's equal to the difference in potential energy between the shells can bump that electron from the one shell to the other. So it's got to have exactly the right amount of energy. And similarly, if a photon has exactly the amount of energy in it that represents the difference in potential energy two electron shells up, then when that photon hits that atom, it's going to bump that electron up two shells but the amount of energy has to be exactly correct for that transition to happen. So chlorophyll can absorb red or blue photons. Remember, red has less energy, longer wavelength. Blue has more energy and a shorter wavelength. So red photons are gonna bump an electron up one shell or one energy level. Blue photons are gonna bump an electron up two energy levels or two shells away from, from where they started.
So green photons are intermediate. They're not going to do either of these things. Remember, it has to be exactly matched to the difference in potential energy that the electron has when it's in farther shell compared to when it's in a closer shell. So that's what we mean by light being absorbed. But then what happens to that electron? What happens to that energy? So when light is absorbed, the electrons are going to enter an excited state. What does that mean? That means they have more potential energy. They're in a farther out electron shell. And the chlorophyll molecules are going to work together in groups called a photosystem. A photosystem is going to consist of two major elements. One is an antenna complex. Your book actually refers to these as light harvesting complexes, same thing. So the antenna is a good image because you have the sense of them just gathering photons from all directions, like an antenna is going to gather other kinds of electromagnetic radiation. Um, so that's a good visual image, but remember that this is the same thing as what your book calls the light harvesting complex. And then the second part is going to be a reaction center where these chemical reactions start to occur. And then the photosystem is also going to include proteins that are going to undergo different redox reactions to process those high energy electrons. So what happens to that electron that's moved to another shell? So one thing that can happen when an electron moves to an excited state is what would normally happen most of the time in the absence of these sort of life processes, it's just going to almost immediately return down to its more stable ground state. So its normal low energy state is called its ground state, and typically it's just going to drop back down to its original state. And normally this would give off either a photon of light or heat. When this electron returns to its ground state, it's giving off the same amount of energy that it absorbed originally with the photon. All the energy in is going to come back out again when that electron returns to its ground state. So this is represented by this image here. It's going to go up to its excited state and come right back down, giving off either light or heat. But when we use these living systems to interfere with this process, it can do a couple of other things. So one thing it can do is when that, when that electron returns down to its ground state, that energy can be used to bump an electron in a nearby atom up to its excited state and just sort of transfer that energy from one pigment molecule to another. So here's a whole series of chlorophyll and uh, carotene pigment molecules. And when this electron returns down to its ground state, it's going to transfer that energy to excite an electron in the next chlorophyll. When that one returns to its ground state, it's going to use that energy to excite an electron next to it. And they can hop from one to another. And we call this a resonance, resonance transfer of the energy. So basically, the electron is not moving. It's just transferring its energy to the next pigment. Another thing that can happen, though, is that excited electron itself can be transferred to an electron acceptor in a redox reaction. So we've got here an excited electron, in this case in the reaction center part of this photosystem, and that electron is just going to be taken up by some electronegative molecule that's going to, it's going to be reduced by accepting that electron. So these are the various things that can happen, and all of these things will happen to a certain extent and at different times during these light-dependent reactions. So now let's take a closer look at this antenna complex, or the light harvesting complexes. So the antenna complex is composed of about 200 to 300 chlorophyll molecules, chlorophyll and other accessory pigments. So this light harvesting portion is going to be just full of these pigments. And when the pigments in the antenna complex absorb photons, so it's gonna, a photon is going to hit one of these pigment molecules, an electron is going to be excited up into a higher energy state, up into an outer shell. Then the energy, but not the electron, is going to be passed to a nearby chlorophyll molecule. So remember, this electron is going to go back to its ground state, re releasing energy that's going to cause an electron in the next pigment molecule to become excited. And it's going to have a chain reaction. You can think of this as billiard balls hitting each other and transferring that energy in the exact same amount as the photon that hit it, because remember that amount of energy to excite an electron has to be in the exact correct amount. 
So this transfer of energy, where the electron doesn't actually move, but the energy is transferred from electron to electron, is called resonance energy transfer. And then after transferring its energy, the electron is going to return back to its ground state, and then the electron in the next molecule is going to be excited. And this transfer of energy is going to occur until it gets here into the reaction center. So now let's take a look at what happens once it gets to the reaction center. So again, the energy is going to be transferred from one molecule, one pigment molecule to the next until it reaches the reaction center. And then once it gets into the reaction center, that energy from the electrons is going to be transferred one more time to a specialized chlorophyll A molecule. And so this pigment molecule is going to be a little bit different from the other pigment molecules. Rather than just transferring the energy from that excited electron, these chlorophyll A molecules are special because they can actually transfer the entire high energy electron to a different molecule. So this is going to end up being an electron donor. It's going to reduce some electron acceptor. So it's going to transfer that ele excited electron, and this is going to be the beginning of, this is going to be where this happens. Electromagnetic energy from that photon is going to be transformed into chemical energy in these high energy electrons that can be passed from one electron carrier to another. So the primary electron acceptor in the reaction center is going to take that electron from that specialized chlorophyll A molecule and is going to be reduced as a result of that acceptance of the electron. And this is basically the start of the light reactions. Once we've got that electromagnetic energy transformed into the chemical energy of high energy electrons, now we start the light reactions. There are two types of photosystems in the thylakoid membrane that are both going to contribute to these light reactions. The first one, unfortunately, is called photosystem 2. It functions first, so the numbering of the photosystems reflects the order in which they were discovered. So you're just going to have to remember that photosystem 2 works first. And the reaction center chlorophyll A of photosystem 2 is called P680 because it's best at absorbing light at a wavelength of 680 nanometers, and so this is uh, red light. In photosystem 1, which happens second, it's going to be best at absorbing a wavelength of 700 nanometers. So this is far red light, just sort of at the edge of the visible part of the spectrum. And the reaction center chlorophyll A of photosystem 1 is called P700 because it absorbs best at that wavelength. So during the light reactions, there are two possible routes for electron flow. One is cyclic, which we'll talk about second, and the other is linear, which we'll talk about now. So linear electron flow is the primary pathway. This is going to be the most effective, most efficient pathway for the electrons to take. And it involves both photosystems, and it's going to produce ATP and NADPH, this reduced form, this electron carrier, using light energy. Let's look at the details now. So there are basically eight steps in linear electron flow. The first thing that's going to happen is that a photon is going to hit one of these pigment molecules in the light harvesting complex, in the antenna complex of photosystem 2. And its energy is going to be passed along among the pigment molecules in this resonant energy transfer until it gets into the reaction center and excites P680. Remember, that's that specialized chlorophyll A that is then going to give up that electron in step two. That excited electron from P680 is going to be transferred to the primary electron acceptor. Now that this P680 has given up an electron, it has a positive charge as a result of giving up that electron, and we're going to call it P680+. So if we ever, ever want to do this again, we need to make sure that P680 plus gets another electron and is ready to um, be excited by another high energy electron coming from the antenna complex. So in this third step, we're going to deal with that. This is the point at which water is split by enzymes and the electrons are going to be transferred to this P680 plus, reduce it back to P680. So why does this happen? In transferring this high energy electron, P680 becomes a very powerful oxidizing agent. 
So in general, uh, H2O is pretty stable, but in the presence of this very strong oxidizing agent, it can be split uh, using this enzyme in an exergonic reaction. So when these water molecules are split, protons, remember these hydrogens have been stripped of their electrons, the electrons have gone to reform P680, so we've got basically protons that have been released, and these are going to be released into the thylakoid space, so the inside of those little compartments. The oxygen is going to be released basically as a waste product, so it's going to diffuse out of the cell and out into our uh, atmosphere where those of us who breathe oxygen can enjoy it. So in the next step, we now have our electron attached to the primary electron acceptor from stage two. Now we're going to have another electron transport chain in which that electron is passed to various electron acceptors, each one of which is going to be more electronegative than the one before it, and it's going to release some of that energy in small steps as it's passed from electron carrier to electron carrier, just like what we saw in cellular respiration. This electron transport chain is going to be the connection between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. So this is how the electrons get transferred from photosystem 2 over to photosystem 1. So energy released by this fall down the electron transport chain is going to drive the creation of a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane. So that energy is going to be used to power proton pumps the active transport of protons against their concentration gradient from the stroma into the thylakoid space. Now we've got a proton motive force, right? There's potential energy stored in that proton gradient, that electrochemical gradient, that is, just as we saw in cellular respiration, going to drive the production of ATP by chemiosmosis using ATP synthase in the thylakoid membrane as those protons move from the thylakoid space back out into the stroma, ATP is going to be generated. In step six, we're now in photosystem one. So photosystem one, like in photosystem two, is also going to be absorbing light using the pigment molecules within an antenna complex. So again, we're going to have electrons excited, transferred through resonant energy transfer into a reaction complex. So transferred light energy excites P700, so that specialized chlorophyll A molecule that's not going to just transfer the energy, it's going to transfer the actual electron, again, to a primary electron acceptor. In photosystem one, we're absorbing another photon of light. But now, once again, we've got this P700 that's given up an electron and now has a positive charge, so we're now going to call it P700+. plus. And it needs to replace that electron, and where is it going to get it? It's going to get it as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain coming from photosystem 2. So this is where it gets its electron back so that this process can be repeated. So now we've got, again, another high energy electron that's gotten another boost of energy from another photon of light carried by a primary electron acceptor, and it's going to again go down another electron transport chain where it's ultimately going to be accepted by a protein called ferrodoxin. That ferrodoxin is going to give up those electrons to NAD plus using the enzyme NAD plus reductase. A proton is going to be taken from the stroma and added to the NAD plus in this reaction. So it's going to take up those electrons plus a proton from the stroma to reduce NAD plus to NADPH. So this is where the NADPH comes from in the light reactions. So the electrons of NADPH are going to be available uh, for the reactions of the Calvin cycle. So now the NADPH has those high energy electrons ready to go into the synthesis phase of photosynthesis. This process also removes protons from the stroma, adding them um, into this molecule NADPH. So now we've seen three places where we have created this proton gradient uh, across the thylakoid membrane. So first, when protons are removed from water and put into the thylakoid space, when it's actively pumped by this electron transport chain between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 from the stroma 
into the thylakoid space and then just by the removal of protons in the stroma to create NADP+. So we have a high hydrogen ion concentration or a low pH within the thylakoid space and a basic environment, high pH, very low proton concentration out in the stroma. One way that it might be helpful for you to visualize these energy changes is by using a mechanical analogy. So we can think of these electrons as balls that are going to be moving around through these photosystems. The first thing that's going to happen is that a photon is going to give the electron ball a whole bunch of energy to bounce way up to a high state of potential energy. So we're representing this as gravitational potential energy, but remember this is an electrons in a high energy state in photosystem two. Photosystem two is going to then hand it over to the electron transport chain. We can think of that as a ramp. The energy is going downward. As it goes downward, it turns this turbine to generate energy to create ATP. As it continues down this slide, it's going to land here on another lever where it's going to get pounded by another photon, giving it another boost of energy, going all the way up here to its very highest energy state where it's going to be transferred to another electron transport chain where it's going to lose a little bit of that energy, but mostly it's going to stay in a very high energy state in NADPH. These falls in energy in these electron transport chains are, are not going to be as extreme as what we saw when Oxygen was the ultimate electron acceptor um, because remember oxygen is so electronegative the difference in potential energy from where it started in the food energy to where it ended up in oxygen is going to be a very large difference in potential energy. In this case we want to make sure that those electrons maintain a much higher energy state that they gained from the photon. So not going to lose very much energy as we go through the electron transport chains in this case. So now let's think about this other form of electron flow, the cyclic electron flow. So this is a really good figure. I think it's really helpful because it sort of has the rest of the linear flow in gray so you can kind of compare it directly to what's going to happen in cyclic electron flow. In cyclic electron flow, there is no photosystem to it. So the electrons are going to cycle back from the ferrodoxin, which in linear flow is going to be that last electron donor that's going to give those electrons over to NAD+. It's not going to do that in this case. In this case, when ferrodoxin gets that electron, it's going to bring it back to this first electron transport chain that's generating ATP. So the ferrodoxin is going to bring this electron back to the cytochrome complex where it's going to continue down this electron transport chain. It's going to get that other an energetic boost from photosystem 1, absorbing that 700 nanometer light in photosystem 1, and repeat this process in a cycle. So cyclic electron flow uses only photosystem 1. It doesn't use photosystem 2 at all. It's going to produce ATP because it's still participating in this electron transport chain. It's the cytochrome complex here that's actually operating that proton pump. So ATP is still going to be generated, but no NADPH will be generated because the ferrodoxin is bringing its electron back to the first electron transport chain instead of donating it to NADP+. And of course, because photosystem 2 is not being used, no oxygen will be released um, in the cyclic electron flow. So some organisms, such as purple sulfur bacteria, have photosystem 1, but they have no photosystem 2. So they're only going to engage in this cyclic electron flow. And this mechanism for the light-dependent reactions is thought to have evolved earlier than this full system using both photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. So photosystem 1 is thought to be the most ancient form of photosynthesis using the cyclic electron flow. So it's possible also that cyclic electron flow may protect cells from light-induced damage. So now let's review this whole process, but let's do it in the actual context of one of these thylakoids so we can kind of visualize better not just what's happening, but where everything is happening. And I want you to think as we go through about this idea of structure and function, how the structure is contributing to the smooth process of, of this function.
So here we have photosystem 2 located in the thylakoid membrane. Light is coming from the outside. It's going to excite electrons in one of these pigment molecules, which is going to resonantly transfer that energy to the reaction complex. That electron is going to be boosted in energy. Meanwhile, we have the PS680 molecule that is in its positively charged form. It becomes a powerful oxidizing agent. It's going to grab those electrons from water, splitting water in the process using an enzyme that's going to release oxygen atoms, which are qu quickly going to pair together with oxygen atoms from another reaction um, from photosystem 2 to form molecular oxygen that's going to diffuse out of the cell and be discarded, leaving two protons. So remember, these electrons from the hydrogen atoms were taken up and used to replace the electrons that were given up by PS680. The other protons are here in the thylakoid space at this point. So then this primary electron acceptor in photosystem 2 is going to give that electron to the electron transport chain through a carrier protein that's going to take it to the cytochrome complex. The cytochrome complex is what is going to use those little energy drops to operate a proton pump that's going to pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. This proton gradient is at this point going to be running this molecule of ATP synthase. It's also going to be in this thylakoid membrane. The knob of this ATP synthase is going to be projecting into the stroma. So when this actual catalytic reaction happens, combining ADP and phosphate, when that flow of protons comes through into ATP, this ATP is going to be in the stroma. Meanwhile, back to our electron transport chain. This is going to be transmitted again through another carrier protein to photosystem. Photosystem, meanwhile, is going to have one of its, have an electron excited in a pigment molecule that excited electron is going to be transmitted. The energy is going to be transmitted until it gets to PS700, which is going to give that electron up to another primary electron acceptor. Meanwhile, it's going to replace that electron with the electron that's coming down the electron transport chain. So now this is reduced again from that electron ready to take up another excited electron. Then the primary electron donor is going to give over that electron to another electron transport chain, ultimately ending up with ferrodoxin, which is going to give over that electron to um, NADP reductase, which is going to combine it with NADP plus and a hydrogen ion to create NADPH which again is going to be produced in the stroma, which is where this next stage, the Calvin cycle, is going to happen. So the ATP and NADPH that are needed for the synthesis part of photosynthesis are going to be right in the stroma, right where they're needed. I should also mention when it gets to ferrodoxin, this is only if we are using linear electron transport. If we're using cyclic electron transport, it's going to take that electron back over to the cytochrome complex and cycle through in the cyclic electron process. So before we wrap up, I just want to do a quick comparison of this process of chemiosmosis in chloroplasts as compared to mitochondria. We saw the same process of active transport of protons across a membrane using energy from an electron transport chain that's release, releasing the energy from high energy electrons a little bit at a time. And then this electrochemical gradient of proton molecules across the membrane is then used to power uh, ATP synthase, the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this happens, this whole process happens both in chloroplasts and mitochondria, but it's going to do it using very different sources of energy. So remember that in mitochondria, we get those high energy electrons from basically stripping them from food uh, molecules that we eat and taking those relatively high energy electrons in food and processing it through this whole chemiosmosis process to form ATP. We get the high energy electrons in the case of chloroplasts from the light energy, those photons uh, hitting these pigment molecules and exciting the electrons, rather than chemical energy being converted into the little packets of energy in ATP, we've got light energy being transformed 
into high energy electrons, some of it going into ATP, some of it going into the high energy electrons in NADPH. And so the spatial organization of this chemiosmosis process differs somewhat between chloroplasts and mitochondria, but also shows some similarities in structure. So in mitochondria, the protons are pumped to the intermembrane space, remember, between the inner and outer membrane of mitochondria. And they're going to drive ATP synthesis as they diffuse back into the mitochondrial matrix. In chloroplasts, the protons are pumped into the thylakoid space, so to the interior of these little thylakoid structures, and drive ATP synthesis when they diffuse back out into the stroma. So it seems to be almost a reverse process, but actually if you think about the structure of these in terms of what's inside and what's outside, if you think about just constricting one of these little Christi and a mitochondrion, you basically get a structure where the intermembrane space is comparable to that thylakoid space. So it basically turns out to be pretty much the same reaction. If we think of the intermembrane space as being comparable to the thylakoid space, the matrix being comparable to the stroma, then we basically have the same process going on. Protons are pumped using the energy from the electron transport chain from the matrix or the stroma into the intermembrane space or the thylakoid space where they become concentrated, creating a proton mode of force. The protons are going to diffuse back through the ATP synthase, driving this rotation of the rotor that's going to power the synthesis of ATP. So they really are actually more similar than you would think. So in the case of these chloroplasts, the ATP and the NADPH are produced on the side facing the stroma. So here we have the ATP, and then we also ended up with the NADPH in the stroma. And this is, again, where the Calvin cycle takes place. And so in summary, the light reactions generate ATP and increase the potential energy of electrons by moving them from water to NADPH using light energy. And these two products are then going to be deposited in this stroma, this outside fluid, outside of the thylakoid, where the Calvin cycle is going to take them up. And we will see how that works in the next web lecture.